I don't know whether it's boldness or rashness that makes us go through so much at once, but this is the first time you and I have traveled together through the book of Genesis, and uh, we're going to try to deal with the whole chapter. But before we even begin to read it, let me confess that this must be an inadequate study. Must be. But an oversight is perhaps good for us. And so we read from Genesis chapter 3 at verse 1. Now, the serpent... The serpent, a very suggestive word. It can mean other things or more than that, but it does mean serpent. The serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, notice her trying to correct him, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. Of course, she's referring to the tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die. It's a very provocative uh, statement. It can read like this, O yea, but thou shalt not die. You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, You'll notice there's no questions for him. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all cattle and above all wild animals. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He, that is the woman's seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. 
You know, my friends, it's a telling thing that not until the last pages of the Bible do we read of the curse being lifted. There shall be no more curse, we read in Revelation 22. And here is the futility of creation begun. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken. You are dust. And to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins, and he clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out. And at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. The first three chapters of Genesis is full of symbolism. But as we have already said in these studies, to approach the book of Genesis, especially these early chapters, as merely symbolism, is to put yourself immediately in danger of missing the significance. To treat the story of creation and the fall as symbolism firstly and finally is to miss the significance. Of course, as with the rest of Scripture, the pages are full of metaphors. But to approach the Scripture as merely metaphor is to lose the meaning. So although we have symbol and metaphor in this story of the fall, it is not firstly symbolic. It is not firstly metaphorical. It is a story that we are meant to take at face value if we are to see those values applied. That's why in our last study we saw two actual trees. Yes, they are symbols. Yes, they are metaphors. But they are not virtual trees. They are real trees in the real garden. And only then did we begin to understand the significance of the tree of the knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. And so before we go on, let's just be reminded that God placed the tree of knowledge in the way to the tree of life. Man could not come to the tree of life unless he passed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the significance of that is so direct that it places a challenge before us immediately In other words, only the right approach to the tree of knowledge led to life itself. And the right approach to the tree of knowledge was simply one of obedience. This was the only tree upon which there was a prohibition. No, and the only no in creation was focused on this tree. You shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And here was the thing that freed the creature made in God's image to love Him. Because love must be expressed in obedience. 
But of course, the wrong approach to the tree of knowledge, that is the approach of disobedience, would lead not to life but to death. And that's why we were so careful last Lord's Day to see that in the Bible there are not merely two gardens but three. And between the Garden of Eden and the new heaven and the new earth, where the river of life flows through the midst, there stands Gethsemane. And the agony of Jesus in which he anticipated his dying in Gethsemane was the only way for us from the one to the other, from Eden to Eden restored through forgiveness. And just as there are not two but three gardens, so there are not two but three trees. And between the tree of the knowledge at which we sinned in Adam and the tree of life which grows again as we find it on the last page of our Bible in Revelation, growing on either bank, on either side of the river of life, the tree that stands between them is the tree of Calvary. And there is no way from one to the other except by the cross. Now, I remind you of that so that in the very same way, being so careful with this chapter tonight, we should not take the fall as merely figurative. It is figurative. It is a figure. It has to be understood in many ways. It has many dimensions. But we do not take it firstly as figurative. It is literal. The fall is a real event, and it's presented to us as such in Scripture. Now, I say in Scripture for this reason. Of course, there are deeper issues than the simple act of rebellion against God. Of course, there are the deeper issues of sin, as the Bible says, understands it and causes us to understand it. There's the rejection of God's mercy and grace. There's the rejection of God Himself in an act of disobedience. There's the whole matter of our natures as fallen creatures in our federal head, in Adam, the first man. There's all of these. They lie within. They lie behind the temptation and fall we read of in Genesis chapter 3. That's what lies behind and beyond and beneath the taking of the only single forbidden fruit. And of course, it is proper, it's legitimate to see this and to use the account of the fall as both underlying and as a metaphor of the twisting and turnings of our fallen human nature. It's the way to understand history, as I'll try to show you in just a moment. But we need to open the pages of the New Testament to see that this is an actual event. Because it's not in the Old Testament, and I don't know if you are aware of this or whether this will surprise you, but it's not in the Old Testament at all that Genesis chapter 3, the fall of Adam, is pinned down as a historical actual event. Now, the Old Testament assumes that it is an actual event, and there is no other legitimate way to read the Old Testament but through the spectacles of the New, so that we see that it assumes that it was an actual event, but we need the New Testament to make it clear that the first Adam was as real as the last Adam Jesus of Nazareth, Christ the Lord. It's the New Testament that causes us to see that the best way to understand the trees and the garden and the temptation and the fall is through the focus of the tree that stood on Calvary. It's because 
the last Adam, Jesus, the second Adam, our Redeemer, is a real person who died a real human death that we are able to see. That that's the understanding the Bible has through and through of the first Adam and of Genesis chapter 3. Let me put it to you like this. In one of the two genealogies of Jesus that we have in the New Testament, this is Luke chapter 3. You know, I'm sure, how it ends. It ends with the words, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. So that when Paul is arguing the very fundamentals of the gospel, he comes to Romans chapter 5 and he speaks of one man's trespass And that is just as real and actual as the one man's obedience. And if the first one man who trespassed is not real, then the second man, Jesus, who died in obedience is not real either. That's why Paul also speaks of one man's disobedience that made us sinners so that the other Adam... The one man, Jesus, obedience makes us righteous to God, cleanses us and makes us new creatures. And the one man's trespass in Romans 5 is just as real and actual as the one man's obedience. In the text from which we sang our opening paraphrase tonight. It's 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter. You know these words, as by one man came death. That's Adam. So by one man came also resurrection of the dead. That's Christ. So that later in that chapter, Paul says, as in Adam, that is, as you and I and all of us who are born by human nature into Adam, our federal head, our representative, all die. Even so, all in Christ, the new federal head, the second Adam, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Do you see what I'm saying to you? That it takes the New Testament to cause us to understand the Old Testament. Now, of course, Genesis chapter 3 does not just tell the story. It does. Genesis 3 also begins to interpret it for us. And here is Scripture almost simultaneously interpreting itself. Now that chapter presents the fact of the fall, but it presents the fact of the fall in its context. That is the context of consequences. The consequence, the first of which is that man was expelled from the presence of God. Verse 23 to the end of the chapter. And the further consequence in recording God's word of response to this fall in Adam, verses 14 to 19, the further consequence is the promise that in the seed, literally in the seed of the woman, of course, in Jesus Christ, the descendant of Adam, there would be restoration and healing. Because in verse 15 of our chapter is the first appearing, even if you regard it only as a shadow, the first appearing of the gospel of salvation. This is what the theologians, those who believe it, like to call the proto-evangelium, the first gospel. The doctrines of grace. The great doctrines of salvation are dependent upon this chapter. It's no wonder that Martin Luther described these first three chapters of the Bible as foundational to all things. Let me just read how Paul puts this. Therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all men sinned. 
sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgressions of Adam, who was a type to pause, a shadow, a kind of the one who was to come. And Paul, of course, means Jesus Christ. The doctrines of grace are latent in this chapter. Now, they are latent. They are not explicit. That is why you need the incredible sharp focus of the New Testament to understand the old. And we have to grasp this if we are to understand our Bibles. Because only in the New Testament does what is implicit or latent in Genesis chapter 3 become explicit. Can I put it to you very simply like this? The Old Testament uses Genesis chapter 3 very little and never once directly. Does that surprise you? Of course, Genesis 3 underlies and underpins and explains much of the Old Testament because the Old Testament is one history of the consequences of the fall which Christ came to correct. But it's not explicit. Did you know that most Orthodox Judaism to this very day denies the doctrine of original sin. Jewish scholars, and I mean Jewish scholars of the Hebrew Scriptures, what we have as the Old Testament, will take on board the idea that Adam brought death on all mankind through sin, but they would say that only applies to physical death. Therefore, not to spiritual death, which is the death from which we can only be saved through faith in the risen Savior. In his little study, his book on Genesis, Kidner puts it like this, it took the work of the last Adam to bring home to us our full downfall in the first Adam. It takes the New Testament to interpret the Old Testament. And above all, it takes the gospel of grace, focusing as it does on the events of the suffering and dying and rising of Jesus Christ. It takes the gospel to reveal to us our need and to show us from where it comes. Genesis chapter 3. Dear friends, let me say this to you as clearly as is humanly possible. The gospel, the gospel does not create that need. It exposes it. It shows us that it is there, the need for forgiveness and renewal. And it answers that need and meets it in the dying and rising of a flawless human being who is the Son of Almighty God. That is the background to the appearance of this serpent. Now, let's just be clear that the Bible calls this serpent a creature. And here's where one of the old chestnuts arise. There are more, of course, than Genesis. Who did Adam's sons marry? Chestnut. If you don't mind me mixing my metaphors, it's a red herring, much like Jonah's whale. It's a red herring. We don't need to be bothered in the least about the presence of a talking snake. This is Satan. That's all we need to know. 
And what we also need to add to that is that evil is already in creation before this temptation. Now, I ask you just to think for a moment, how could there be a tree of the knowledge of good and evil if evil were not already present in creation before the fall? And what do you make of Jesus' words as we find them in Luke chapter 10? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Evil was already present. Now, be careful with this because we have to set that fact beside the fact that this is a creature being used to tempt the woman So there is no suggestion that evil invades creation from outside of it. There is no no evil independent of creation. Rather, evil is a matter of rebellion within. And that's where the Bible identifies for us the serpent as Lucifer, the the Satan and and the devil, as Revelation puts it. There's a sinister shadow, in other words, behind this serpent. Not visible from the beginning. Not clear even at verse 15. But fully exposed by the New Testament, as we'll see. This is Satan behind the serpent. And yet it was a creature... The significance of that is very simple. It's that the mistress was tempted by a servant. The greater tempted by the lesser. This morning we were just quoting in the bygoing Matthew chapter 16 where Peter turns to Jesus and tries to deny his intention to go to Jerusalem and die. He is tempted by Peter Is that not the greater being tempted by the lesser, the master tempted by the servant? Get behind me, said Jesus, not Peter, but Satan. And while we have no time to think about that tonight, I simply leave you with it to reflect on it, the temptation of the greater by the lesser. But let's look at how this temptation begins. It's like most temptation ever since. It begins with a suggestion. Did God say? Sin has its roots as far as humanity is concerned in questioning the Word of God. It does. So does yours. So does yours as a Christian. Did God say? It begins questioning the Word of God and goes on to smuggle in a flattering suggestion. What's the suggestion? Did God actually say the suggestion is that God's Word is subject to our judgment? So that thirdly, we are offered the possibility of interpreting this word without truly applying it. Did God say? Did God say? And what does he do? He not only questions God's word, he exaggerates it. Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? That's not what God said. That's an exaggeration. God, of course, as the woman tells the serpent, God only said there was one tree of which they were not to eat. But he exaggerates and begins this debate with an exaggeration. He distorts the Word of God, just as he would do with Jesus when he tempted him in the wilderness. Has God not said? And Eve responds by correcting the tempter. No, that's not what God said. God said only that we are not eat we are not to eat of one of the trees. But notice she has fallen into the trap he has set and she overcorrects him. 
she goes on to say something that God never said. She adds the words in verse 3, neither shall you touch it. That's false. God never said that. And here is the first falsehood in the Scriptures about God. And I ask you to note, and to note so very carefully, that it's a falsehood of over-strictness. How telling that is, that the first falsehood about God is a falsehood that distorts His nature and presents Him as more strict and commanding and demanding than He ever was. She says, not only that we weren't to eat of the tree, but we weren't to touch it. God never said that. He said simply, one, no, don't eat. My friends, there are many, many successors to even this who distort their presentation of God by presenting Him in over-strictness because they mistake holiness, true holiness, for strictness. And some of you have suffered from that for many years, suffered from its consequences and feelings of unworthiness so that you'll never feel worthy to come to God and trust Him for your forgiveness because that's the way you've been taught God is from childhood. It's the first distortion about the nature of God. He is more strict than He is. And it's because she has now fallen into the trap and has distorted her understanding of God, has distorted the word God gave to her and her husband, that she is now open to his flat contradiction, his first great lie, you shall not die. Now that Eve is confused as to what God actually said, the devil calls God a liar. More than that, he suggests that God is lying because He's a cheat. Because God is afraid that this creature will become like Him. He's envious. That's how God is. You see the distortions beginning to multiply on the basis of this presentation of Him as more strict than He really is. And the first thing the devil denies is the reality of judgment as a consequence of sin. You shall not die. Isn't that one of the first things to be denied today? There's no hell. There's no temporal punishment for sin in this life. God doesn't send any consequences of our wrong choices and our rebellion on us in this life. God's not like that. And do you see the pendulum swinging from presenting God as too strict to presenting His love and mercy as softness? You shall not die. I ask you to recall the fact that the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, ends with Jesus speaking about judgment. And nobody in the Scripture but nobody speaks more tellingly and challengingly about judgment than the gentlest, most loving man who ever walked the face of the earth than Jesus. Oh, but God's not only a liar. He says God's a cheat. And that's the point at which he presents the temptation to this creature of God. This creature that already bears the image and the likeness of the Almighty. He says, here's the real way to be like God. You'll become like God if you disobey Him. And what an intoxicating temptation. What a tragedy. Making God no longer creator and friend but man's rival and man's enemy. And what is offered, if not a horrendous distortion? The devil presents God's creative, sustaining love as envy and jealousy and selfishness. He presents to the woman 
the liberation that comes through obedience as slavery. And finally, he presents to her an act of spiritual suicide as a step of freedom. You shall not die. And we note that at this point, the serpent puts a bare assertion, you shall not die, up against the Word of God. If you recall the words we read earlier, you'll understand why I say to you now that the essence of this temptation we find in John's first letter, do you remember the verse that says that this is all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life? But then, my friends, Jesus was tempted in exactly the same way. All these I will give you if you bow down and worship me. But Jesus heard the voice of God, whereas Eve was listening to the creature instead of the Creator. Eve was driven by her impression instead of her instructions. It was her feelings that ran away with her. This intoxicating temptation to become like God. And so I ask you to note the two active words in verse 6. You know, the gulf between verses 6 and 7 is the actual fall. It's a tragedy. It's like a huge, dark, black hole, the space between these two verses. But look at verse 6, and what are the two active words, the two verbs? She took and ate. She took and ate. Not until another Adam came and said, Take and eat. Would the consequences of that be undone? But when Jesus said, take and eat, to what costly sacrifice was he referring? She took and ate. And to undo it, Jesus said, take and eat. But what is it if not his body and his blood that we are to receive? Everything changed for the woman, for Adam, for all history, for all humanity in that one event. It's almost as if we could apply backwards the statement Paul makes to Titus where he says to the pure all things are pure, but to the corrupt and unbelieving nothing is pure. Their minds and their consciences are corrupted, and that happened for us at that moment. Here is our inheritance as fallen human creatures who need to be restored by grace alone. Everything is changed, and I believe that Eve with Adam became at this point grotesque distortions of themselves as the image of God was fractured in them. Do you notice their expedient for sin, their pathetic fig leaf aprons? My friends, just as these were totally inadequate, so any human antidote for sin and covering for sin doesn't work. You have to turn to verse 20 to see God slaying one of his creatures in order to cover their sin, to know that there you have a figure that only death will atone for sin. The true and only covering for our sin is the atoning death of Jesus. It's there in a figure. We can never cover the consequences of sin. Only God can. And God has in the gift of Christ His Son our great atonement. But before we leave 
man being expelled from the garden tonight. Let's just note that from now on, man is ill at ease with himself and within himself. He's now at war with his Creator. He is an enemy. He's at war in his own soul. He is ill at ease with his companion and his beloved wife because he is ill at ease with God. And that's why what comes next is this awful confrontation, hiding from the face, that is, from the presence of God. That always reminds me, does it remind you of Revelation, those two places which speaks of men hiding from the wrath of the Lamb. But the same book of Revelation also speaks of us ultimately being able to see his face. when there are no more tears nor sorrow. But we want to notice how God deals with His fallen image bearer. Of course, He knows where they were. And of course, He could have, and in one sense, should have driven them out immediately, but He doesn't drive them out. He draws them out. Where are you? And you'll notice in Adam's response, verse 10, the first mention of fear in the Bible. I was afraid. Fear belongs to sin. I was afraid. He was never afraid of God before. The Apostle of Love, John, says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and he who fears is not made perfect in love. Do you see what we meant when we said that the first distortion of the person of God is a distortion towards over-strictness? There is no fear. No fear of God until sin enters. And God now questions this creature who has made himself his new enemy, his beloved but fallen image bearer. And in his questioning and in his response to Satan, we have the first glimmer of the gospel. Now, we've no time again for this tonight, but I simply put it to you that verse 15 of chapter 3 is like a history of the whole of mankind, enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed. That's the history of mankind until Christ comes. But it's also the promise of Christ's coming in grace to save us and then eventually in power to reclaim us. You see, this is where the New Testament takes these statements and makes it clear that this is not a talking animal. It is Satan. Do you remember Paul in his closing words to the Romans says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. He's referring to Genesis 3.15. Do you remember those two verses in the book of Revelation where the devil is described as the ancient serpent who is the devil, Satan, to make sure we don't misunderstand. But at this point, do you see also the deliberate bypassing of the man to address the woman? Because it's from the woman, from her seed, that Christ shall come. So that eventually a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. So that when the time had fully come, as Paul puts it, God sent forth His Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Yes, mankind is now and from now on excluded from the presence of God. There is no way back into Eden. The sword of the Spirit is there to turn him away, lest he eat of the tree of life and place himself beyond redemption through the death of Christ. 
there is no way back to Eden. It's not just hard. It is impossible because God has said so. This is why humanity cannot save itself. Why no system will work to restore us to utopia. Why every human fruit has a worm in it. We cannot save ourselves. We must find the one who is mentioned as the seed of the woman. There is only one way back to God. Through the one who would be bruised to heal us. Who would die to give us life. Who would rise to restore us. There is only one way back. Through the second Adam. Who to the fight and to the rescue came. Through the second Adam. Through his cross. And in his resurrection.